Amen. Okay. Uh, last time we had talked about, or were we talking about the story of the LNG Libra, the ship that uh, in 1981, it was built in the 70s, in 1981, stopped dead in the Philippine Sea because the tail shaft fractured, broke in two, 33 inch diameter shaft. And here is the defect. Oops. Shaft has this big hole in the center. We talked about that being a piping defect from the casting operation. But in fact, there's more to the defect than just that. If I look at a higher magnification of the shaft, surface of the shaft, um, the defect is down here. That's the casting defect. This is a brittle fracture, and this is a fatigue fracture. The smooth stuff out here at the edge is the smooth, smooth fracture. This is a piece. This was the piece that was in Singapore. The other one was in uh, New Jersey uh, when I got to see him. But in any case, it turns out the reason it failed or the brittle fracture occurred is because of thermal stresses. On a large forging like that, I mentioned that it, ta it can take two weeks for a very large forging, a forging that's 60 inches in diameter let's say initially, uh, it's going to be forged down to a 33 inch diameter shaft. Well, that's only a factor of two reduction. And if you remember the old cold welding argument, you're not going to close up those pores, some casting pores, unless you get to 80% reduction. And a factor of two is 90%, it's only about a 50% reduction in area. Um, actually, it's fact, it actually is um, a factor of two on diameter is a 75% area reduction. But in any case, if you take a big shaft and you just stick it into the furnace, into the hot furnace at uh, 2200 degrees or 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, um, what will happen is it will take time for the heat to diffuse in. The outer surfaces of this shaft are gonna be hotter than the inner surfaces, and so you have a temperature profile that looks like this. Okay, you can't cook a roast beef in five minutes. It takes time for the heat to diffuse in and uh, cook the inside, right? Uh, same thing for a big piece of steel. Now, if the outside's hotter than the inside, that puts the outside wants to expand more than the inside. And if it expands, it's locked to the inside, so the outside goes into compression, and the inside goes into tension when you're heating it up. Right, everybody see that? The inside's colder. The outside's expanding, so it's trying to pull it apart. And that's exactly what happened to create on this shaft. You got this hole to begin with, and this brittle fracture essentially occurred during the heating in the furnace when they were heating it to forge it. Now, it probably occurred on one of the last heatings, because they probably had to heat this two or three times to put it in the furnace, forge it some, put it back in the furnace, let it get hot again, get nice and uniform, take it back out and, and forge it again. But in any case, I, I don't know, maybe they left it out too long and they didn't put it back in the furnace hot. There are many times in heat treating of large sections, you'll find that the specification will say, heat to an intermediate temperature and hold it for four hours or eight hours or 10 hours and then raise the temperature again. Well, what you're doing is you're trying to avoid the residual stresses. It only takes about three to 400 degrees to achieve yield level residual stresses. A temperature differential in steel, actually it's only about 200, 300, 200 degrees. Uh, how do I know that? Well, you can do the calculation. The thermal strain is equal to the coefficient of thermal expansion times the change in temperature. Well, for steel, I have about 10 to minus 5 um, inches per inch as the coefficient per inches per inch per degree C, or per degree, degree C. Let's say, I don't remember if degree F or degree C, but it doesn't matter. It's all order of magnitude. If I multiply that by a delta T, of 200 degrees centigrade, I'm going to get a strain of 0.002. Well, 0.002 strain 
is the yield strain. 0.002 strain in a material that has 30 million modulus, which is steel, is 60,000 psi. So a 400 degree centigrade temperature differential could potentially give me a compressive stress on the surface of 120 ksi. And that's going to be balanced on the inside by a pretty substantial stress. Yep. Huh? The stress, the strain. Oh, the stress from the strain? The modulus, the, well, stress is equal to the modulus, Young's modulus times the strain. So that's 0.002 times 30 times 10 to the 6, okay, that's going to be 60,000 PSI. 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI is the modulus, the only modulus of steel. Sorry, you're taking a short drive. Um, so that's 60,000 PSI. At 200 degrees, so 400 degrees, I potentially could have 120 KSI compressive surface residual stresses. And even though this, the center may have a larger area, um, it turns out that you could get 50, 60, 70 KSI, whatever it is. And I have a pretty good initial flaw size to begin with. I got this great big flaw in the center, right? So if the material is brittle, now hopefully the material is not so brittle, and at higher temperatures it's not going to be, but they probably took a cold piece of steel and put it in the oven when it was brittle. It hadn't been, it hadn't been through the heat treatments that are going to give it the fracture toughness that we'd like. And while it went in the furnace, they call this type of defect a clink, because if you're standing next to the furnace, you'll hear, actually, you don't even have to stand too close to it, you'll hear a large clink sound as the fracture runs through the steel. Okay, it's like someone hit it with a bell, you know, hit a bell, um, and so it makes a clink. So it turns out, for this particular shaft, we did some calculations. And depending on the emissivity of the furnace, because this is, depends on how fast you're heating the thing in the furnace. So you can do various emissivities, furnace temperatures, and you can calculate under different conditions. So this is a 1650 degree furnace down here. You have a, a lower uh, emissivity of one, but the temperature of the furnace is only 960. You can see the difference between a 960 degree furnace where the stresses are only gonna get up to around 25 KSI in a 1650 degree furnace where the stress doesn't get to 100 KSI, potentially in the shaft. And this is as much of the radius across the shaft. Oh, I'm sorry, that's time and hours. That's, I'd have to go back and see where, what, this may be at the center of the shaft, uh, as far as that goes. But you can calculate these things and you get some fairly substantial stresses. Okay, so now we understand how the forging defect was there. We understand how the clink was there. If we go and look, at the microstructure, you'll find, if you look at the steel, polish it and look at it in a microscope, you can still see the casting porosity that never got forged together because they didn't get enough deformation in this thing. Okay? So that's evidence that those black spots, that's all clustered porosity. So this thing was Swiss cheese to begin with because they didn't start with large enough forging. So you can go through, well, if you look at some of the secondary cracks, you can see the cracks basically are joining up between these clusters of porosity. This is an edge surface, so you can see the microstructure of the steel, but you have cracks essentially joining the clusters of porosity. Um, then you can do a fatigue study, and we're going to do a little bit more on fatigue in a second. Um, but here's your, ca your piping. Um, cavity, here's your clink, which is this model region here, and then you can follow what we call the beach marks. Fatigue leaves, every time the fatigue crack opens and closes, it leaves a little ridge, which we call striations. And so I can measure how far the crack grew on each cycle. In fact, that's how I get my DADN curve to measure my delta K for my, for my fatigue uh, material properties. Um, that's one of the ways of doing it. So I could go and look in a microscope and I could see these little ridges. But even macroscopically, if you've looked at fatigue cracks long enough, you'll actually see what we call these beach marks. 
you actually also have what we call river marks. And that's what some of these other things are. But you can draw the arrows. Initially, as this thing's going around in, in, in uh, torsion, torsional loading, the fatigue crack's growing all the way around, grows outward. Here it reached the surface. And eventually, it had to turn the corner and start growing up these way, this way. And these little lines here are the beach marks as it's growing up. The final fracture area was about that big, okay? Which says something very important. It wasn't an overloaded shaft. If you only need about 5% of the final area to hold the whole shaft together, it's not heavily stressed, right? We'll get to a little more on that. That's a key thing in looking at a fracture and trying to figure out uh, what's going on. It turns out fractures tell you something about the stress that they were growing under. Okay, fatigue, particularly fatigue fractures. Um, actually, overload fractures do too, but they just tell you they grew above the strength of the material. Well, they did have techniques that should have, and in fact did, catch this defect. Uh, the, the shaft was to be ultrasonically tested. And ultrasonics are no different than um, when you do ultrasonics on, on humans. I had a, a CAT scan once, and they noticed something, a cyst uh, on, a, on a kidney, so they did ultrason ultrasonics, and they found um, they mapped it out better. Okay, basically you got your material, in that case it was my abdomen, but in this case it's a piece of steel or a shaft, and you have a little piezoelectric transducer. Piezoelectric material is a material that if you apply a force, it gives a voltage, or if you apply a voltage, it gives you a force. So I can apply a sine wave voltage ultrasonically, 100 kilohertz or megahertz, we'll talk about ultrasonics later, but um, yeah, in, on another day, but I put, let's say, a megahertz signal into this vibration, and I basically just put some, some like, typically in the business they call it goo on the surface. It's kind of like a, a Vaseline or a, a glycol oil or something, different, different types, which is a couplant. So you're basically going to vibrate that liquid, and that's going to put the vibrations into the, into the material. And... The, well, one technique is pulse echo. So you send out a pulse. It's just like sonar, okay? You send out a pulse, and you get it back, and you measure it, and you put it on an oscilloscope. So here's your initial pulse, and here are your return pulses, and this is showing, here they're showing a pulse in the middle, which you're not supposed to get in a solid material. And that's exactly what the, uh, the uh, technician found at the steel mill. And he went in to tell his boss. His boss threw him out and said, get out of here. And the guy, you know, wrote it up and showed this football-sized defect on his little ultrasonic test report and filed it away. It never got sent to the shipyard. No one ever looked at it uh, until after the fact. Okay? So, so they used ultrasonics to, uh, to detect it. And in that case, it was successful. And we'll, we'll talk later in the course about different different. Uh, well, non-destructive test techniques and what their sensitivity is, but you got to be a pretty incompetent um, technician to miss a football size defect. Or in this case, it wasn't just football size because he was doing end on. He actually was seeing the whole clink, but he actually was able to draw out the football shape. That's as far as that goes. I mean, it's right there on the test report. Almost perfect size. I mean, he, he nailed it, right? It was just his boss who didn't. Okay. Um, so that's the story of the Libra. Nothing happened other than about $10 million of financial loss. Nobody got hurt. Um, but one of the things to remember in most failures, there's usually a reason why something fails. Um, and one way to think about the different reasons, a useful way, you can find this in some of the books on failure analysis, you can have a defect in design That means you just overloaded it. You can have a defect in material. You can have a defect in manufacturing or assembly. Or you can have abuse in service. Now, let's take the Libra. <coughs> 
Was design a problem? No. It failed. It only, you know, the, the shaft held together until it was just hanging on by one little ligament. So it was not a defect in design. Was it a defect in material? Yeah, it had a football-shaped defect. Was it a, but even that football-shaped defect, as someone pointed out, I think it was you the other day, shaft should be hollow. Well, the reason uh, your drive shaft or your automobile is hollow is because it goes pretty fast and they're trying to save weight and they can get tubes that way. Um, naval um, shafts um, are hollow because, again, you're trying to save weight but it's expensive to make them that way. Most commercial shipping are solid shafts because it costs money to put the hole in, in the tube. Um, but that center core, that football-shaped defect, didn't cause this failure. If you were to do a stress analysis, you know what the operating stresses are. And the operating stresses, as you, go, as you go to the center, they go to zero, right? Um, and so the stresses are low at that point, and if you did fracture mechanics, you find you never could have, if you hadn't had the clink, the brittle fracture that brought you all the way within four inches of the surface, that shaft could have, you know, they would have sent it back as scrap to the steel mill after they had scrapped the ship and the thing never would have failed. It was the clink that did it. It was the manufacturing defect of putting the thing into the furnace, a hot furnace, when it was cold that really did this one in. You could have even tolerated that big core. Okay? In general, materials are much more tolerant of defects than we usually give them credit for, which is good. And you like to err on, on the side of conservatism. Now, abuse in service. There wasn't any particular abuse in service in this thing. So you can actually go through, and there were two types of defects, a material defect and a manufacturing defect. The one that was relevant was the manufacturing one in this case. Right. Um, it, it's a question is, what do you define as your material? In this case, defining the material as the shaft that you're going to machine the thing from. Okay. It's actually manufacturing. The, they, they actually go together. Uh, but um, yeah, you're right. I could have put this one down here. I just, it was not homogeneous material to begin with when the designer assumed that the material would be homogeneous, right? This was a crack that grew from an inhomogeneity in the material. These are not fixed, firm things, uh, but I find it's useful quite often when people are arguing over why something failed. Okay, um, You can go through different things. For example, let's take the Seawolf submarine had cracks in it. It wasn't a design problem. It was a material problem. The welding wire had a very high carbon concentration. A high, it was on the high end of its chemistry. And as a result, during manufacture, you had some cooling rates that gave you very hard weld metal, much stronger than you expected. You wouldn't say they were doing something wrong in manufacturing or assembly, and certainly wasn't abused in service and never got that far. Okay? It really was improper control over the incoming material. Okay? Now, if you go back a little further into the details of it, there also had to be hydrogen present to cause these cracks to form. You could, have, you could have survived high strength metal if you didn't have the hydrogen present as well. And after the fact, they went in, they started measuring hydrogen contents, and uh, I ended up, uh, it's been long enough now, I think I can probably say this, I ended up writing a report that we didn't have a lot of data, but we, looked, we had three different diameters of weld wire, and if you plotted the hydrogen content that electric boat measured as a function of the diameter of the weld wire. This was like uh, 16th, 0.45 and 0.31 of uh, weld wire. So various MIG weld, gas metal arc welding wires. If you plotted the hydrogen for like 10 different wires, you found the, wire, the hydrogen content of the wire increased as you went to smaller diameter. It like doubled. You know, for the 031 wire, it was like double the 062 wire. So I had a 30 second, um, 045, and I had a 16th inch diameter wild wire. Well, what do you conclude from that? You probably don't conclude anything, because you're not a metallurgist. But 
I concluded it was likely that they had not, the manufacturer of the wire had not removed enough of the drawing lubricant from the original wire manufacturer. Drawing lubricant has got hydrogen in it, it's hydrocarbons, stearates typically, soap, if you will, but hydrocarbons. And if they're supposed to clean off, you know, degrease the wire after you greased it to lubricate it, or to, to draw it down to a smaller diameter, if the hydrogen content is going up with the surface to volume ratio, smaller diameter is larger surface to volume ratio, that sort of suggests that you had a surface contamination problem on your wire. Of course, the wire manufacturer hit the ceiling on that, okay? I mean, I don't know, it wasn't us. You know, we didn't do it, okay? Um, and I don't know, I mean, we didn't have, at that point, it was in the middle of the whole thing, we didn't have enough data to say for sure, but you can do simple little analyses and kind of help head you to, to see if that's the problem. I'll bet you that after that report, you know, I don't know what the Navy did, but I bet you they have, I bet you someone wrote a specification on how to clean welding wire and how to test it afterwards, uh, so far as that goes. Um, okay, what else should we talk about? Um, let's talk briefly about residual stress. So if this was, if I was at temperature going into the furnace, and this is the stress in the furnace, the interesting thing about what stresses you'll end up with in your part, and it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about the, the tail shaft or whether I'm talking about something else, I have never seen an exception to this rule. I suspect I could probably prove it if I had to, but I never wanted to sit down and do the mathematics. But um, your room temperature residual stress is always going to be the opposite pattern of your high temperature thermal stress. So if I have a large part and I put it in a furnace and it's not uniform in temperature, I'll introduce stresses in that part at high temperature because of the non-uniform temperature. That will cause yielding, in this case, the yielding, there'll be compression here, there'll be tension here, and there'll be compression on this surface down here. So I got compression here. If this compresses, and I don't do anything else to it except take it out of the furnace and let it cool to room temperature, and this compresses and this stretches from what it was originally, this is now going to be, this is uh, um, the part that's compressed when everything comes back to uniform temperature. The part that's compressed is now going to be in tension. And the part that was in tension and stretched in tension is going to be in compression. So your room temperature, uniform temperature, after you go through a thermal, a thermal straining because of non-uniform temperature, your residual stress pattern, when everything comes back to uniform, uniform temperature, is going to be the exact opposite pattern. And that's the worst thing you could have in the case of the Libra because now I have not only the service stresses, I have the residual stresses on these outer fibers that are going to help drive that fatigue crack. And that's probably enough for today. Um, next time we'll talk about fatigue. Okay. Um, we've been talking about fatigue and fracture. Um, let me show you, and you should have this in your handout too. Um, this little plot, which you'll find in a dozen different books on fatigue and fracture, which was probably done 30 years ago by someone, tells you how to analyze a fatigue failure. I told you you get these little beach marks on the surface, and the fracture will start at some point, and you'll have these beach marks, just like the waves coming in at, uh, or going out at low tide will leave these little rings of debris as the, as the tide goes out, as the crack grows, it leaves these little pumps on the, fracture, uh, on the fracture surface because when the crack grows and stops on one cycle, it stretches and then when it closes, it changes the work hardness of the material right there and the next time it grows, it, it leaves kind of a little wave and you can see those things. And this is a very complex graph, but it's very useful in many ways and lots of different things plotted on it. Here you have high nominal stress and low nominal stress. For example, oh, 15 years ago I used to have some marine surveyors for our fishing boats and things. You know, they, used to, they, they kind of latched onto me and they would bring by one, once or twice a month some failed part of an engine or some uh, propeller shaft or something and say, why did it fail? 
you know, someone's got a claim, a claim they want a new engine for their fishing boat or something. Um, and I would just look at the part and, you know, I'd, I'd write them a little one-page report for the insurance company to say whether it looked like it was a latent defect or not. Because in the marine insurance policies, if it's a latent defect, it's covered. If it's a patent defect, you know, if it's obvious, then you should have repaired it, right? Um, so, anyway, for the last year, it seems like all of a sudden some of these same guys, or I don't know if maybe it's just the insurance companies have changed their policy, but they're bringing in a couple of months now of these little things. So, I, I don't know how many, I probably looked at half a dozen propeller shaft failures in the past, in the past six months. Um, and they're fatigue failures. Uh, sometimes, the, usually the crack starts at a keyway because that's the stress concentration. Uh, but one of the first things I look at is to see whether the final fracture area, in this case, the final fracture area is the area that doesn't have the little rings, okay? If the final fracture area is small, like this, okay, then that means that the shaft was under a relatively low nominal stress. In fact, we looked at the, the LNG Libra tail shaft, and I showed you that it was a 33 inch diameter shaft. The final overload fracture area was only about this big. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that the last ligament running this ship was this big on a piece that's this big in circumference, that it's a low nominal stress. It's not, over, it's not an under design. The thing is adequately designed in terms of the normal service stresses. Now, another thing to, to understand is that the, there's something called the endurance limit, particularly for steels. There's not always an endurance limit for aluminum alloys. But if I look at my old SN curve, or this is stress, and this is numbers of cycles in logs, log of number of cycles, I'll get some curve that kind of comes down like this and flattens out. If this is the uniaxial yield stress, this value where you reach the endurance limit is something on the order of 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 sigma yield. So if I got 100 KSI steel at below 40 KSI, the thing will never initiate a fatigue fracture, okay? Um, so, if I have a fatigue fracture that looks like this, and over half the surface area is final fracture, then I clearly was at over 50% of yield, and I don't have to wonder why the fatigue crack initiated. It's obvious, it was at a high stress. And all I, it's probably going to initiate at some stress concentration or whatever if there is one, uh, but it's loaded to a value above its endurance limit, and you expect it to fatigue if I get enough cycles. And then just the question of what the actual stress level is. Then you have to ask yourself, was it supposed to have seen that kind of stress? And there's obviously other questions in doing that failure analysis. But if I get one of these others, this way over here with low nominal stress, I say, well, how did I ever get a crack to start? Well, then you have to look at whether you have a stress concentration. This is no stress concentration, mild stress concentration, se severe stress concentration at high nominal stress. Each one of these has about 50% or greater final fracture area. The shape of the crack front varies depending on whether there's a stress concentration or not. In this case, low nominal stress Again, the shape of the crack front varies depending on whether I have a stress concentration or not. If I have a stress concentration, I can initiate a fracture at low nominal stress because the stress concentration could take an op a nominal stress down here of uh, 0.2, and if I have a factor of three stress concentration, at that notch, it could go up to 0.6 if I have a three-fold stress concentration, right? Three-fold stress concentrations are relatively sharp notches, but not terribly sharp. So um, a, a tenfold stress concentration is an extremely sharp notch. I've only seen a couple of those in my life. But a stress concentration between one and a half, almost anything will give you one and a half stress concentration, any type of change of shape. In fact, the stress concentration is nothing more 
uh, there are whole books of nothing more than stress concentration factors. I almost brought them with me today, but decided not to. But depending on the radius, you basically have lines of stress, and when those the lines of stress, if this is an intention here, go around the corner, they bunch up, and you get a stress concentration. Um, there are different ways to get around stress concentrations, but basically any time you have a change in section thickness, uh, if, you, if you have a notch, the stress has to go, the stress, the stress lines, and this basically, if you, if you solve the airy stress function for you stress analysts, okay, so airy stress function is basically just Laplace's equation. So if I was looking at heat flow in something or, or something, it's the same mathematics. Okay, or fluid flow through a pipe. Okay, there's there's a concentration or electrical resistance in a wire. If I have a notch in something, I'll get a stress concentration at the root of the notch, and that's just solving Laplace's equation for flow of something through there. So you can think of flow of stress across a, a notch or something. If it's a sharp notch, high stress concentration, low stress concentration up here. So if you have a stress concentration, you can easily explain. A what is more difficult to explain is the stress concentration. That's an unusual fracture. That says there was some unusual event at some point in, in the part's life that gave it a very high stress that started the fatigue crack. Otherwise, it, if, it, if it had only seen the low nominal stresses for its entire life, it never would have gotten a fatigue crack. But if you have a low nominal stress by, because the final fracture area is small and you have evidence of no stress concentration, you have to say, what was the unusual event? And in fact, the reason I may have to go to Seattle next week is a helicopter case where a helicopter crashed. It had a sudden stoppage when it, when it had a hard landing. The rotor blade hit a tree stump and it put a big torque, unusual torque, on the main mast, and 25, they, they should have scrapped it, but they didn't call it a sudden stop, they called it a hard landing, which turns out the, the requirements for are different uh, in doing the, uh, the overhaul. And they put it back into service in 25 minutes. The, what happened, it was an over torque, and you have to fly And you also have between the transmission and the rotor hub. And when it got the high stress, there was not a crack, but there was probably, if they had done the proper inspection, there was probably a slight twist to the to the spline teeth, which at the end of the spline teeth created a little local yielding, which created a residual stress. And so the nominal stress is way down here. You'll never get a fatigue crack in a proper helicopter rotor mast because you're down here. Except if I apply a residual stress on top of the service stress because of this one-time overload event, now at that location, I'm up here. And I can start a fatigue crack, and that's exactly what they did. Okay. Um, there's no, I mean, this, this is on a Huey, okay? Hueys have got something like 25 million flight hours. I mean, it's not as if we don't know how to design mass for Hueys, right? Um, there have been three, maybe four Huey fatigue failures on mass, and you can trace some some unusual event to every one of them because the designers designed them down here where fatigue will never be a problem as long as you don't go whack it too hard sometime in its life. And all I have to do is look at it's a little bit harder because it's not just simple. It's a hollow shaft. Because it wants to be lightweight. I can go through the fracture mechanics and everything, and I can prove that the shaft was not heavily loaded. I can measure the spacing between these little fatigue marks. And I can go back to my other graph of fatigue, which is the delta K graph, right? You do delta log delta K, which is the the cyclic stress intensity versus DADN. If I go in and you get a graph that looks like this, which is a material property, so I go look at 4340 steel, look it up in the handbook, and I look at the spacing between the fatigue cracks and I say, um, 
I say, gee, I'm right here. The stress this thing is growing under has a stress intensity of this value, because I measured this, right? All I have to do is read off the graph, and I'm down here. I now know what delta K is, and delta K is just delta sigma square root of pi C. If I know how long the crack was at that spot where I measured the, the, the beach marks, or the striation spacing, I know this, I know that, I can calculate that. Okay? If I do that, I find that the stress that that was growing under is way up here. Whereas I know from all the tests, the design tests, the experimental tests, and 25 million hours of flight history, the regular stresses are down here. What gave me the extra difference? The fact that I practically deformed the mast in service. Okay? So that's, there's, the metal actually leaves behind a witness of what stress it was operating under. By the striation spacing or by the final fracture area, you can calculate a lot of details of these things. And what they've done here is this is for a circular shaft, um, and this is all for tension tension or tension compression. Down here is a whole set for unidirectional bending. Here you have reverse bending, and down here you have torsion. So you can, and that's, it's a compl complex graph, but if you get used to it, you can look at a fracture surface and you can say high nominal stress, low nominal stress, stress concentration, was it bending, torsion, tension, what was it? Sort of like reading tea leaves, right? Just bending back and forth this way. Rather than just bending this way in one direction, reverse bending is going back and forth, okay? Uh, you go plus and minus in tension. You go, in one case, you go from zero stress to a positive stress. In the other case, you go from a negative stress through zero to a positive stress, is reverse bending, okay? Straight bending is just bending all in one direction. And so if you're looking at the outer fibers, it goes at one location. So anyway, it, it takes a little while to learn some of the, some of the uh, ways to, to read the fracture surface. But a couple hundred fracture surfaces, you actually get to the point where you can look at them and, and, uh, and, and tell all kinds of things. And people say, wow, how did you know that? In fact, uh, one time, this was uh, back in the early 80s, I was working for a test lab around here. These guys from a nuclear reactor, uh, uh, a commercial nuclear reactor, sent me a bolt and said, uh, we want you to tell us what happened. I said, well, one of the first things you do is you, you look for what's the history. Well, tell me what the operating is. I said, we're not going to tell you anything about it. We want to know how much you can tell us without our telling you anything about it. And so uh, I said, oh, okay. And so this was actually a test. They wanted to know if they were going to use this test lab in the future for their, because they always have failures and they want to. So this was one that probably wasn't a big problem, but they wanted to know when they had a big problem was, were they going to get a good test lab to, uh, to work on a project? And so uh, I called them back the next day and I said, well, um, it, uh, it was a threaded bolt. I said, of course, there's a stress concentration. However, this saw some big impact loads at a temperature of around 600 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd say it saw at least three, if not seven, major loads. And the guy says, well, that's right. Um, well, how can you tell? Well, and I said, oh, I also said, and it occurred over a significant period of time. It wasn't just over a few minutes. It was over hours or several days or even longer. He says, that's right. And I said, uh, he says, how do you know? I said, well, it turns out this thing had different colors. And you at 600 degrees F, 550 or 600, you get a blue color to the surface of steel. Okay, in fact, sometimes in carbon steel it's called blue brittleness. And it turns out the reason this bolt failed was because it was a brittle bolt. And I think I told him it was brittle too. And in fact, we'd done a chemical analysis on the bolt, and I told him it had failed to do due to blue brittleness because it had gotten it was a it was a bolt in a steam boiler, and the fracture surface had this blue oxide on it. And there beneath that there's a a um, a straw color oxide. So at about 400 or so F, you get kind of this brown straw color. 
on the fracture surface and you go up to 600, you get this blue color. You go higher and it just kind of turns gray uh, oxide, sur oxide surface. And it has to do with the same type of colors on the titanium when you anodize it. The thickness of the oxide layer reflects the light differently. And so you can tell that, you can actually tell the temperature the steel operated at in the 400 to 600 range based on the color of the steel. Uh, it's a useful thing. I mean, people, I've used it in bearing failures to see how hot the bearing, the balls got in the bearing. I mean, if the balls come out and they're straw colored, it got to 400 degrees, which means at that point, the, the grease is all melted away and you have a lubricant breakdown. You know, you know. So in any case, I could tell that it saw some in, impact loads because I could see these beach, beach marks, but the beach marks were really wide and they were very non-uniform. And that was another thing I told them, they, the, the impact. Well, it turns out they'd had a steam hammer in this boiler. And they, so they had had some big bangs. It had occurred over a long period of time, it was 600 degrees. And the reason they had used a carbon steel bolt rather than an alloy steel bolt, and out, carbon steels are susceptible to this embrittlement at these temperatures, whereas alloy steels are not. And so uh, they were happy. But uh, uh, you don't usually get someone who refuses to give you any information about the details of what happened. But uh, it, it's actually surprising to a lot of people of what you can tell. One time, well, 15, 20 years ago, I had the, they had a couple of pieces of aluminum they'd taken out of the Alfera uh, radar antenna. Lincoln Lab had taken these out. And it turns out that uh, when they built this radar antenna, this, this is out in Kwajalein in the middle of the Pacific. And this microwave radar uh, was originally built for some research purposes, but it just has the right, right frequency and it also was in the perfect location. So if the Soviets ever launched anything from Kazakhstan, you could tell what the orbit was going to be before it got to orbit. Okay, and that was a very useful thing to have early warning of what the orbit was going to be when they did the, the launch. And so and MIT Lincoln Lab designed and, and is for the last 40 years has maintained this thing. Um, and this, this radar dish cost a couple of billion dollars to replace, I think, or at least a billion or something. It's, it's not a cheap thing. Uh, it's been improved over the years. And it's had like 30 times the original design expected life. And so they're always doing repairs on it. And this has been, ever since 1978, I've been working on different parts of Altair um, to help keep it, keep it going, okay? Because uh, you can't afford to build another one. Uh, whenever, it, whenever it's down for maintenance, it's top secret because that would allow the Soviets to shoot things on. I mean, now we don't worry about it as much, but nonetheless. Um, anyway, they had these big aluminum struts that were great big tubes. And originally they were, when you weld aluminum, you get a lower strength. And so they designed the welds in the longitudinal direction. You weren't supposed to have any circumferential welds in the original design, but they had realized these guys had actually welded circumferential welds rather than buying long plates in two, on two of these four struts, they had actually spliced plates together so you had some circumferential welds. And these guys knew enough about the design that they said, ooh, we've overstressed these welds because the aluminum welds are not as strong as the, uh, the heat treated aluminum alloy. So they sent me these things and I actually did hardness trace across the, uh, the heat effective zone of the aluminum. And I was able to tell them over the previous 30 years what the highest stress this had ever seen during a hurricane. Okay, because of the the metal in the heat affected zone is soft, which weakens it, but it actually, when, it's, when, it, when the hurricane came by and the high stresses on it, it actually yielded at the heat affected zone. That increased the hardness. It worked hard in the surface. Knowing what the hardness was there, it told you what the highest stress it had ever seen in 30 years. So now we had a proof. So it's interesting. Metals, they don't always leave a fingerprint or witness mark, but they, you know, they often will leave evidence of the environment they were in or stresses that they were under. And if you know how to look for it, you can get some pretty good information. So I'll see you on Monday and we'll talk some more about failures or whatever.